This week's episode of Bad Things in History is sponsored by your well-being. Take care of yourself. In last week's episode, we touched on some disturbing discoveries made this year, but this week we're covering something everyone has thought about at least once. People who defend themselves in court instead of having a lawyer handle it. Criminals may not be good citizens, but they seem to dominate headlines. If you bother watching the nightly news, eventually you will see a story about somebody who has been charged with a crime and is awaiting trial. In the United States and most Western countries, any person charged with a crime is usually entitled to a free lawyer to help with the legal defense. In the past, this was not always the case. Even today, when they are entitled to a professional legal defense, some people choose to represent themselves in court. Usually, this is a bad decision, but sometimes, through either necessity, luck, or sheer force of will, it works. Today, we are going to look at a few examples in United States history where people acted as their own lawyers and won. Identification, please. Edward C. Larson is an African-American civil rights activist. In the 1970s, he was also the victim of a malicious legal system. Between 1975 and 1977, Edward was detained by police at least 15 times. In almost all these cases, he was either just walking down the road or was the patron of a nearby diner. The reason Edward was arrested is because police were asking for his identification. Edward did not provide it when asked. A California statute at the time made this a crime. Although he was arrested numerous times, Edward was only charged twice. Of the two charges, only one resulted in a conviction. But that was one too many for Edward. In 1975, acting as his own attorney, Edward C. Larson sued San Diego Police Chief William Collender as well as a few other officials. In 1981, the United States District Court ruled in Edward's favor and told California to stop enforcing the law. The police chief, William Collender, appealed the ruling. It went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, which upheld the district court ruling in 1983. Although Edward represented himself, he did have widespread support. In addition to the brief Edward filed with the Supreme Court, the ACLU and NAACP also added opinions. Furthermore, he received political support from Jesse Jackson, Dick Gregory, Maxine Waters, and John Conyers. The San Diego Police Department finally had to admit defeat and stop harassing Edward. After the ruling, California was no longer allowed to enforce its law requiring identification. The statute was officially repealed in 2008. All in the Family It probably isn't surprising that career criminals have a deep understanding of the legal system. Sometimes they use this knowledge in surprising and beneficial ways. Giacomo Jackie D'Anorcio was a prominent figure in organized crime in the 1970s and 1980s. He was initially a member of the Philadelphia crime family. However, in 1980, the head of that family, Angelo Bruno, was murdered. A power vacuum resulted, and eventually relations between the Philadelphia organization and the Lucchese family in New York deteriorated. Jackie, understandably, didn't want to be killed, so he switched allegiance to a New Jersey branch of the Lucchese family. The United States government wanted to take down all of them. In the 1980s, they began doing this by using the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, or RICO for short. The federal government arrested about 40 people from all over the country, including 20 members of the Jersey crew. The members of the New Jersey family that were arrested were subsequently indicted for 76 RICO violations. Jackie was already in prison due to an earlier conviction on drug charges, so he couldn't free himself by winning the RICO case but he could at least avoid additional years of confinement. During the trial, Jackie fired his attorney. From that point forward, he defended himself. Whatever legal knowledge he lacked, Jackie made up for it with a charming personality. He convinced the jury not only of his innocence, but of the other 19 defendants as well. The jury acquitted all of them. Prosecutors were stunned by the outcome. Most of the New Jersey family walked out of the courtroom and went back to running their criminal enterprises. Jackie remained in prison until November 2002. He died in 2004. The Right to an Attorney Before 1963, if a person was arrested and couldn't afford an attorney, that was just too bad in many states. 
For poor and minorities that were charged with a crime, defending themselves in court was the only option, and the outcome was usually a prison sentence. On June 3, 1961, in Panama City, Florida, the Bay Harbor pool room was robbed. Somebody broke the door, destroyed a record player and a cigarette machine, and stole cash from the register. When police investigated, one witness said that Clarence Earl Gideon was seen near the business on the morning of the robbery. Based on this and nothing else, police arrested Clarence. He was charged with breaking and entering and intent to commit petty larceny. Clarence appeared in court alone because he was too poor to afford an attorney. He asked the court to appoint a lawyer to defend him. However, under Florida state law at the time, only defendants in a capital case had that right. Clarence Earl Gideon's request was denied. Having no choice, he acted as his own lawyer during the trial. The jury found him guilty and the court handed down a sentence of five years in prison. Clarence did not give up and accept his fate. He filed a petition with the Supreme Court of Florida, claiming his Sixth Amendment rights had been violated. The court ruled against Clarence, so he appealed the decision to the United States Supreme Court, which decided to review the case. The U.S. Supreme Court did not intend to let Clarence serve as his own attorney, and they appointed one for him. The attorney they selected was Abe Portas, a prominent Washington, D.C. lawyer who would one day become a Supreme Court justice. Portas argued that the existing framework for deciding when the state had to appoint counsel was unworkable. They made the decision early in the case before the facts were fully known. Therefore, they couldn't possibly make a correct decision. Fortas also made another argument that even attorneys who are charged with crimes don't represent themselves. As an example, he mentioned the case of Clarence Darrow, a famous U.S. attorney who hired a lawyer when he was charged with perjury and jury tampering. On March 18, 1963, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of Clarence Earl Gideon. The ruling caused Florida to release over 2,000 prisoners, and they had to give Clarence a new trial. Clarence had an attorney for the new trial, he was acquitted of all charges once the jury rendered his verdict. Clarence Earl Gideon died at age 61 in 1972. Intermittent Windshield Wipers Most of the time, people who act as their own lawyer do it to defend themselves from criminal accusations. But sometimes it can happen in civil cases as well. Robert William Kearns was very unlucky. On his wedding night in 1953, a cork from a champagne bottle hit him in the left eye. For the rest of his life, he was legally blind in that eye. In 1963, when he was driving through the rain, the windshield wipers on his Ford Galaxy caused issues with his vision. He realized he could fix this by making the windshield wipers move every few seconds with a slight delay. The existing ones were constantly moving back and forth quickly with no delay. Robert filed a patent for this invention in 1963. He approached Ford with the idea, and they liked it. Ford wanted to put it into vehicles starting in 1964, but when they realized that Robert had already created manufacturing facilities for the intermittent windshield wiper, they stopped. It was only a small delay for Ford. They went ahead and included the feature on their vehicles starting in 1969. Robert Kearns wasn't happy and challenged Ford on the issue. In 1979, he finally started legal proceedings. Robert also refused settlement offers, requiring that the case be heard in court. He was seeking $395 million in damages. The case ended in 1990, and he was awarded $10.2 million. Ford wasn't the only automobile manufacturer to ignore the patent. He also filed suit against Chrysler in 1982. In 1992, the case was finally decided, and Chrysler was ordered to pay Robert Kearns $18.7 million with interest. In 1995, Robert had received around $30 million from the company. Robert William Kearns died in 2005. He had prostate cancer, which spread to his brain. The combination of cancer and Alzheimer's finally ended his life on February 9th. Crazy Lawyers Kill Sometimes lawyers who commit crimes do defend themselves in court successfully. George Remus was born in Germany in 1878. He moved with his family to the United States in 1882. Eventually, they settled in Chicago. George's father couldn't work, so George supported the family by working in his uncle's pharmacy. George Remus graduated from the Chicago College of Pharmacy at 19 years old and 
bought the pharmacy at 21 years old. Over the next few years, he bought another pharmacy and expanded the business. George grew tired of the family business and became a lawyer at age 24. George Remus specialized in criminal defense, most specifically murder. He became famous when, in 1914, he pioneered the transitory insanity defense, which is known as temporary insanity today. George Remus was so successful that by 1920, he was earning the modern equivalent of $6.3 million per year. On January 17, 1920, the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution went into effect, as did the Volstead Act. Alcohol prohibition began, and so did bootlegging. Over the next few months, George noticed that his criminal clients were becoming incredibly wealthy by illegally producing and selling alcohol. He decided that he could do this too. George also thought his knowledge of the law would keep him safe. George Remus tried to use a loophole in the Volstead Act. With a government license, he could purchase distilleries and pharmacies. The alcohol that was produced could be sold for medicinal purposes. Of course, there wasn't much profit in selling alcohol legally. Most people weren't allowed to buy it. So George had his own employees hijack the liquor shipments. Then it was sold illegally for a huge profit. In less than three years, he made $40 million. George's legal loophole didn't work. He was eventually brought to trial for thousands of Volstead Act violations and was sentenced to two years in federal prison. While in prison, George befriended an inmate. He eventually confided in the fellow inmate that his wife, Imogene, controlled all his money. The inmate was Franklin Dodge, an undercover prohibition agent. But instead of reporting the information, Franklin resigned from his job and began an affair with Imogene. Imogene and Franklin liquidated all of George Remus's assets. They next tried to have George deported, and after failing, finally hired a hitman to kill him. The person they hired decided to warn George instead. In late 1927, Imogene filed for divorce from George. On the way to court to finalize the divorce, George ordered his driver to chase the cab carrying Imogene. He had the driver run the cab off the road. Then George Remus walked up to Imogene and fatally shot her in the abdomen. In court, George Remus served as his own defense attorney. He used the transitory insanity defense, claiming he was distressed by his wife's betrayal. The jury took only 19 minutes to acquit him. However, because he was also found insane, he was sent to a mental asylum. He was set free after seven months there. George lived until the age of 73, finally dying in 1952. In this episode, we showed you five different examples of people who acted as their own lawyer and succeeded. It's important to note that most people who adopt this strategy fail miserably. Those that went against the odds and won are inspiring, or troubling depending on your point of view. Edward C. Larson and Clarence Earl Gideon simply wanted to be treated fairly under the law. Jackie DeNorcio and George Remus desperately wanted to avoid more jail time. Robert William Kearns just wanted to hold large companies responsible for patent violation. The real question is whether the existing legal system is the best option. Is it okay that companies can violate a patent and the patent holder must pursue them for over a decade? Is it okay that known criminals can use loopholes in the system to avoid punishment for their crimes? If it isn't okay, then what should we do about it? We have no idea, so tell us what you think in the comments. And if you enjoyed learning about this topic, then please like the video and subscribe to our channel for more. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.